I want to do them, I want to do them. And you know what? Sometimes you can't do them, and you can't deal with it. So you say, okay, I'm going to go do it, and I'm going to do it my way. That's why portals are bad, it gets in your mind. It's like you want to go out and do it, but something, you know, back in your head, like, yo, does it hold you back, you know? You want to do it, but you don't. I mean, he did it once. Do something. It's like you want to go out and do it. You see a few things on the, on the screen, you, you might want to try. I'm going to go do it, and I'm going to do it my way. When you hear these men talking about pornography, the things they say seem almost unbelievable. But if you listen, it's clear that these guys are only demonstrating exactly what social scientists have been finding. Pornography does, in fact, affect the male attitude towards sex, and especially towards women. And because hardcore pornography has now become so mainstream and legitimized, some men don't even mind talking about it on camera. There is no arguing the fact that pornography is a hotly debated issue in America today. On the one hand, there are those who believe pornography is harmful to their community and should be censored, which of course offends those who believe that any censorship violates freedom of speech, a freedom we as Americans hold dear. Widening the divide even further was the controversial interview with serial killer Ted Bundy. And, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. Bundy's claim that pornography influenced his behavior ignited a huge debate over whether there is a cause and effect relationship between pornography and sexual violence. Today, pornography is more pervasive than ever, from the neighborhood video store to your home computer. When did it all start? Up until the 50s, pornography was shunned, a back alley taboo. But in 1953, something happened that would challenge and ultimately change the way Americans felt about sexually explicit material. If you want to talk about what happened in the pornography industry, we have to point to the late, later months of 1953, when Playboy hit the stands. And what happened is Playboy changed the nature of pornography in the Western world. Prior to Playboy, pornography was the under-the-counter um, low class, it had an image of being associated with low class males and anyone, any male who wanted to buy it was ashamed about buying it, it was in a brown paper bag, he had to find outlets for it. What Hugh Hefner did in December 1953 when he introduced pornography into the market was he made it respectable. He gave it an upper middle class aura and he did this very purposely. When you read about Playboy and you read about Hefner and how he intended to sell Playboy, he sold it as a lifestyle magazine, but as an upper middle class life mag lifestyle magazine. So what he says, for example, in the first Playboy in 1953 was, um, the Playboy enjoys his cocktails, he likes to listen to music, he likes to talk about philosophy, he likes Picasso. This was a coded way of saying that the new Playboy, the new guy who consumes pornography, is no longer this low-class guy who scurries in dirty passages or dirty alleyways. What he is, is this upper middle-class male who will consume this magazine which tells him how to dress, uh, what to wear, what to buy, what to eat, and also the pictures. And the pictures were tagged on in selling it to the reader because the reader did not want to see himself as a pornography user. The reader wanted to see himself as an upwardly mobile male who would consume this magazine in order to know how to have the Playboy lifestyle. And what happened between 1969 and 1974 was a battle between Playboy and Penthouse of who could produce the most explicit magazine. Penthouse won. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, the end of the, that sort of war between the two magazines was 1974, the very time that Hustler published their first um, issue. And it's no accident, because what the battle between Playboy and Penthouse did, in terms of opening up the pornography, was it pushed the limits of what was acceptable, and what was acceptable to be distributed through the mainstream channels. And so you could buy it in kiosks, you could buy it in airports. Prior to the 60s, you couldn't do that. And that's what has made it such a multi-billion dollar a year industry. So Playboy, Penthouse and Hustler, together, as a group, worked to push the limits of what's acceptable. Without these key people, you would not have the industry you've got today. They laid the legal, the economic and the cultural groundwork for this multi-billion dollar industry we now have. Since the late 1970s, the pornography industry has exploded into a multi-billion dollar a year business. They have exploited every form of communication there is in order to take it out of the back alley and bring it directly into your home. 
90% of all neighborhood video stores have a section for soft and hardcore pornography. It's a regular video store, you can get whatever, but then you can go in the back room and you can also get, you know, a little something else for yourself, special. You know, you take the wife and kids, and then you creep around the back room and you pick up something special. Cable and satellite deliver pornography directly to the home. dial porn is a six billion dollar a year business. U.S. phone companies estimate that 70% of all calls are made by minors. A new trend in the adult bookstore industry is the large outlet chain store, usually in the heart of a suburban neighborhood. Behind me is an 18,000 square foot porn store called Castle Superstore. Castle boasts that it's going to have 500 stores nationwide in the next five years, and they say that they're mainstreaming pornography to the public. The internet has made all types of hardcore and illegal pornography available to anyone with a computer and a modem. Well, we did this survey um, a, a year and a half ago with MSNBC. It was the biggest survey ever done with internet sexuality, and we found a, a, a number of very important findings. One of the findings was the significant percentage of people who were developing sexual problems with, in their online sexual usage. And this had never been quantified before. And what we found was that 1% in a very conservative definition of people had very serious problems with online sexual compulsivity or addiction. And up to 15% of people had some degree of problems with their online sexual usage. And even the conservative definition of 1%, when you think about 20 million people in the U.S. go online for sexual pursuits, 1% of that is 200,000 people with severe sexual problems with the internet. We think that's an epidemic. It's an epidemic that's unrecognized and it's something that really needs attention. I'll be at my house and my little brother's on the computer and he'll be sending stuff back and forth to people that he meets and you can see some pretty crazy stuff on there. I think the problem with the internet and what makes, um, what makes it more of a concern around issues like pedophilia is that these people form their own virtual communities online. So it's hard for pedophiles to find each other right now. But on the internet, there are places that they can go and there are groups that they belong to on the internet where they can trade information, they can trade pictures, they can trade tips. And they also form a virtual community, which means that they insulate themselves further from larger societal values. So they can say, you know what, this is good. Those guys are all picking on us. This isn't a problem. Back in Greece, they did this all the time. And that insulates them and protects them. It makes them more um, difficult to treat more difficult to break through the denial and for them to see it's a problem because they have this community that's supporting their views. And on the computer you can get a lot of shit. Pictures of 14 year olds. Yeah, oh, definitely even younger. You know, people ask why is the internet so powerful around sexuality? And we think that it's something that we call the AAA engine, which has to do with access. It's there 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, whenever you have an itch. Affordability, you know, the internet is such a vast thing that it, there's supply and demand. You can get all kinds of sexual pictures and all kinds of stuff for free. And the third A is anonymity. So people engage in all kinds of things that they wouldn't do anywhere else. They wouldn't do these behaviors, they wouldn't engage in these behaviors anywhere else. And when you engage it in it enough times, there's a concern about whether it desensitizes you to it and whether you're more likely to then take it offline and engage in it offline. What's on the internet? What's available? Uh... It's everything, dude, from child pornography to, to straight up whips, to flamethrowers, bestiality. It's out there. It's out there. Have you seen child pornography? Yeah, you can say that. You know, again, kids are on the internet and they go everywhere. And whatever software protection you have on your computer, they defeat it. They're, they're the experts on um, internet and software. So whatever you, whatever you try to do, they defeat. And they go everywhere and they see bestiality, they see rape, they see sexual violence. And again, I think it can confuse them. Oh my gosh, oh. look at those girls. And I think it can hurt their attitudes about sexuality. What are the consequences of exposure to hardcore pornography at an early age? We can't answer that question. As a society, we have no idea how this is going to affect our children in the future. Oh, oh look at that one. one! Oh, man! Since pornography was first mass merchandised in the 1960s, the effects on adult males have been studied and documented by social scientists, doctors, psychologists, and law enforcement officials. They cite the following as the most common effects. Addiction. I'm addicted to pornography. If you tried to, have you ever tried to quit looking? I have, no, it's all I, I mean, I gotta see porn. Sex miseducation. You learn things about women by looking at porno? Yeah, they're down for anything no matter what they say. 
No matter what they say, a girl is down to do it. She'll take it in the... She'll take it in the... Whatever. Desensitization. I get less attached to her emotionally and more just down for physical sex. Conditioning. Before porn, I never, I never, before I really got into porn, I never hit it from behind. It got me more comfortable with that. That's something that you do. It got me into just, just freaky positions, basically. And acting out. You ever gotten violent with it? Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing? Uh, like, she would pretend like she's getting raped, and I'd pretend like I'm raping her. That's, that's from porn. When we hear the word addiction, we usually associate it with a substance like alcohol or drugs. Yet pornography, even though not an ingestible substance, like cocaine, seems to be used by many people in a compulsive drug-like way. In fact, many pornography addicts exhibit the same symptoms as drug addicts, such as tolerance, the need to have a harder and harder dose, dependence, becoming dependent on your drug of choice, and withdrawal, the feeling of physical pain when you are without the drug. All of these painful symptoms seem to promote out of control behavior as the addict tries to manage his addiction. But how can pornography, something that is not ingested in the body like a drug, be addictive? How can certain activities that do not involve a drug, like skydiving, eating, or sex, cause such a higher mood alteration? What we realized in the early 70s when endorphins were just being discovered was that the capability to get high lies naturally within all our brains. We now understand that non-drug related activities or experiences can stimulate similar chemical reactions inside the brain that mimic the action of drugs. The key to understanding how all highs occur is understanding how natural chemicals in our brain work. These natural chemicals are called neurotransmitters. One of the more well-known neurotransmitters are endorphins. Neurotransmitters are produced inside the many billions of brain cells, stimulated by electrical impulses from the nucleus of their home cell. Neurotransmitters are released into the synapse. It is these natural chemicals that are responsible for all highs and mood alterations. Even when drugs are taken, it is still these natural chemicals that are responsible for the high. Drugs only create a situation for these neurochemicals to overstimulate. Activities or events can also stimulate the release of these neurochemicals. The excitement and danger of risk taking cause the natural release of the neurotransmitter dopamine into the synapse, creating the same high as cocaine. The phrase adrenaline junkie is actually quite appropriate. The pain and stress involved in bodybuilding causes the natural release of neurotransmitters called endorphins, creating a sense of euphoria, and relaxation similar to the effects of morphine or heroin. The pornography experience also triggers the release of powerful mood-altering neurotransmitters. The elements of addiction that we've worked with over the past 20 years that compel people to repeatedly engage in compulsive pleasure-seeking activities are arousal, relaxation, and fantasy. Now, of all the tools for addiction, drugs, gambling, skydiving, and television, Sex addiction seems to combine these elements with more frequency and more intensity than any of the other activities. While looking at pornographic imagery, excitatory neurotransmitters are released into the synapse, causing the body to become extremely energized, just like the high of cocaine. It gave me a, like a, an adrenaline rush, like I was doing speed or something. It feels like this incredible charge of life flowing through my veins. It was like getting a rush in the arm of adrenaline. At the height of this energized state, orgasm occurs, causing the release of endorphins, which create relaxation and euphoria. So right there in the pornographic experience, we have a synthesis of arousal, relaxation, and fantasy, unparalleled in any of the other addictions. We now understand that the pornography experience can trigger natural neurochemicals in the brain just as powerfully or perhaps even more powerfully than the drug experience. Let's go back into the brain to see how a physical addiction to pornography can be created by the overstimulation of these neurochemicals. The brain has a...
is now altered and has become dysfunctional. It's this dysfunctional level of neurotransmission that causes the uncomfortable symptoms of physical addiction, tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal. Because there are now less neurotransmitters in the system, it takes a harder, perhaps more violent form of pornography to achieve the same sexual arousal. Just like a drug addict needing a larger dose to get high, this is tolerance. Because the dysfunctional rate of neurotransmission is uncomfortable, the addict uses pornography to bring it to a normal level. He is dependent on it, just like an addict becomes dependent on a drug. If he tries to quit using pornography, he will experience actual physical discomfort. Again, just like a drug addict. This is withdrawal. Sex addicts also have a withdrawal experience. In other words, physically there is a withdrawal experience. Uh, it's different than, say, alcoholics who experience a withdrawal that happens in about three days. And it's very intense and then you dry out. It is much more like what happens with cocaine addicts. The withdrawal was very hard. Very, it came on very fast and it was very brutal. I experienced a uh, withdrawal that I had never experienced from drugs or alcohol. When I stopped looking at pornography, it was hard. It was like a heroin addict trying to quit cold turkey. One of the things that occurs is they have extreme insomnia. If they really try to stop, their body then starts to resist this. Did you feel like when you had to stop pornography, was it like withdrawal? Yeah, I was like, it was definitely withdrawal for me. And then I, you know, I, would, I was depressed. I wouldn't talk to my friends and stuff. I was going crazy, you know? One of the more fascinating things to me as I talk with sex addicts is that cocaine is one of the drugs of choice of sex addicts. Another aspect of the pornography experience that adds to the addictive nature is the extreme emotional low or shame that directly follows the intense arousal. It's these two emotional extremes that create the addictive cycle. The high is followed by a low. The low is so painful that the user is easily tempted into pornography use, again, to escape the pain. With each use, the addict becomes more emotionally dependent on pornography to feel good. This is called psychological addiction. The cycle is also common in drug addiction. However, the sexual addictions seem to stimulate a much more devastating sense of shame that can cause extreme emotional trauma. Steve? The problem with shame in these sexual addiction and pornography addictions is that it has a very powerful crippling effect upon the man. And in fact, what it does is it pulls him deeper into the addiction. And the more he indulges his appetite, the more he feels ashamed about it and degraded and abased and the more that makes him vulnerable to go out and do it again so it's kind of like a spiraling circle that goes down 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 that shame breaks the bridges you have with everyone around you spouse family children friends people at work and the result of it is is that you become more and more isolated i felt so empty i felt so alone Steve? Um, when is it? Come on, man. One of the things you'll frequently hear them say is, I, I couldn't talk to anybody about what was really going on inside of me. You don't dare talk to people about it. It's, uh, it's something you're so ashamed of, you won't, won't tell your best friend. We're talking here about something that literally catapults people into an abyss of pain. I know I've been to the point where I was almost tempted to just do away with myself because I, I couldn't see any, any way out. The only way I knew out was to end my life, and I looked forward to that. And the only relief you have is the addiction. Pornography ultimately is a manual on gender, how to be masculine and how to be feminine. The stories and stuff that were in the magazines. There were stories, you know, little byline stories and stuff like that about Man, how she likes this and how she like wants this like and that. how good it was to her. They're and, aroused by that stuff. And I got hooked on that. I got to thinking that it was true. I got to believing that it was true. I think in our culture, where there's very little open and honest talk about sex in any way that highlights the power dynamics of heterosexuality and of gender. What happens is pornography comes in and fills a vacuum and I think it does teach important lessons about how to be male and what to expect from women. When you look at pornography, do you learn anything about women? Do you learn about sex? What do you learn? Uh, I, definitely, you learn. I mean, 
Sometimes you'll be a little bit passive, but then a lot of women like you to be aggressive. So you learn new techniques, maybe try to be a little more aggressive with the girl when you have her in the bedroom. Pornography delivers an image of masculinity that is dominant, that is removed from emotion, that is removed from um, any moral decision. What I learned from pornography, I learned, I learned to, to do it now. I learned, I learned, I learned to have no inhibitions about it. You know what I'm saying? I learned to, I learned to, to be free. Pornography portrays women as things things to be penetrated. That's what women are in pornography, very clearly. And I think what men learn from that, or rather what they're relearning again and again from all the images, and especially through pornography, is that women exist for male use. Pornography taught me over the years that, uh, that women were sluts, that uh, they were a sex object, they were just to be used sexually. What have you learned about women? Uh, that, that they want sex more than they, than they admit that they want to have sex all the time. There's no, nothing human about her. Everything that makes human beings human is stripped away in pornography. And in its place, <laughs> men are delivered a pair of breasts, a vagina, an anus, and every orifice that you can imagine that a penis can be stuck into. I learned, uh, I learned doggy style. Uh, I learned how to, you know, do the clit. I know how to work it. I know all that stuff, you know? Front way, sideways, in the back. All the good stuff. And that's what pornography is very good at doing. It's good at stripping away the humanity of women and delivering this object to a man. I grew up on, on pornography as a, as a young kid, you know, like 13, 14 years old, and, and, and I discovered new things about women through pornography. It was, it, was, it was an educational experience, I would have to say. The most common characteristic or principle promoted by hardcore pornography is that women love to be ra raped. They enjoy it. They say no, but they mean yes. They say no, but if you'll force yourself, they will ultimately yield to you, and when they do, they will enjoy it, and they'll enjoy it so much that they'll finally uh, plead for more. Legally, he raped her, but she wanted to be raped. She wanted to be raped. Women, women today, they, they just... They just give it up when they get drunk. They want to give it up. They, they want, want to, to give pretend. it up. Do you think they like to, some women enjoy being they raped? Let me tell you about women. No, like women do not enjoy yeah. the being not raped. raped, but they want to be forced a, they, to bleed. They want their hair pulled on. They want to be you and they want to be They spanked. want they want that front that they're raped, but they know they're not being raped because they, know they want it. They know what they're doing. They know they know what they're doing. You're right. He's they know what these guys are absolutely right. That's why I want to be here. I think pornography can, can desensitize viewers, for instance, to uh, women's pain. When you look at pornography, do you become less sensitive to women? Yeah, that's true. That's, that's a good point right there. You want to degrade them, man. <laughs> that it's easy to become much less aware of what, if you're in a sexual relationship with a partner, what may be pleasurable or painful to her. Manhandle them, you know, like, oh, oh, come on, like that. If you have seen a pornographic world, in which the repeated violation of women not only is taken to be uh, sexually pleasurable for a man, but one of the things pornography does is it constructs these activities as pleasurable for women. What have you learned from looking at pornography? What have you learned about women? They're horny. <laughs> They're very horny. One of the interesting things about pornography is that everything that happens in pornography is depicted as being sexually satisfying to a woman. So if a woman is performing oral sex on a man, it's depicted as giving her sexual satisfaction. Women are almost orgasmic continuously through pornography. Whatever a man does to her, whatever she does to herself, whatever she does for a man, all of it creates sexual pleasure for women in pornography. That's the way the pornographic world works. Now, let me tell you this, women want it more than men. Yeah. Yeah. They don't show it more than men, they want it more than women. And I think if you watch that repeatedly, but it cultivates an attitude in which it's, I think, very easy to lose track of in a real-life sexual relationship with a real woman what that woman is feeling. Can pornography make you harsher yes. or less? It makes you very rough. It makes you very, very rough. It can thrust you out. It makes you It can, I think, dull your sensitivity to the pain and the pleasure of a partner. Have you ever done anything just sort of over the top that when, when you were looking at it? Nah. <laughs> That's about forced, it. Forced, forcefully? Huh? Forced, did you force it? Did you force her to do it? Yes, I did. You can say that. Yeah. 
i think that what is true is that the pornography itself is so brutalizing and so desensitizing that once you are convinced not just intellectually but but in subconscious ways that you don't even know about that a woman's wife life is not worth what your life is worth once you think that she's less valuable than you are as a human being that is a key that opens a door to doing all kinds of things to her that you would never do to somebody that you thought was a human being when i was sixteen years old i kidnapped a seven year old girl from a mall at knife point and kidnapped her from the mall and sexually assaulted her on a mountain road outside of uh... of town pornography played a big part in the attitude i had towards females women girls in general they weren't human they're there for men's gratification and they serve no other purpose in life there's nothing human about them i didn't know how to relate to women other than the ways i had seen men relate to them in, in movies and magazines i had no social skills beyond that I abducted the girl from the mall because she was smaller and I knew I could force her into doing what I wanted. Pornography erodes away anything moral about people. And what pornography does is it sexualizes violence against women. And when you sexualize violence against women, you render the violence invisible. Like with hardcore stuff on the internet, does it ever, does it ever, do you ever say, hey, that's violent? No, no, no not at all. No, no violence, no violence at all. And that's what pornography does really, really well, which is why you will sometimes have violent images and it's hard for men to see the violence because it is so highly sexualized. Some people say there's a lot of violence in pornography. Do you no, no. no, it's not. It because how you like it. It all depends on how you, if you like something violent, if it turns you on, then you like it, but if it's not you, then it's not you. Is that right. bad for men to be turned on to violence? No, it's not. No, 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 it's not. And it gets delivered and experienced in a sexual way, and that violence is therefore rendered invisible. In my experience, pornography conditioned many appetites in me that I didn't have. I don't, I don't believe that I had these appetites before they were fed and watered and uh, by, by pornography. I, I think that it is the nature of pornography that it takes men from who they are to being somebody different. That it teaches them to feel pleasure in areas that they would not have explored on their own. It, has it turned you on to other types of sex? Definitely. Like, like what? More aggressive. A lot more aggressive. I don't think that it's true that you have to have a pre-existing uh, tendency um, to, to hurt women or to be sadistic. Sure, I'd, I'd fantasized about raping. You know, I'd, I'd seen a few, fr few uh, films with my friends, and they were pretty violent, violent acts in these films. And it, it, it got me sexually aroused to watch these acts, and the, the women were being beaten. Uh, raped, tied up, raped, sodomized, and, and I found myself getting sexually aroused by that. Had I not seen that, them films, I don't know how I would be today. And when I went on to do a PhD in studying media and its effects, I began to see that all that was being said about media in terms of its effects and the way it's constructed our notions of reality could also be applied to pornography. And in fact, in a more powerful way, because you watch media and you masturbate to pornography. Pornography just, like, uh, kind of satisfies a lot of male fantasies. Yeah. And do you masturbate after you look at pornography? Hell yeah, if I'm watching pornography, it's usually for the purpose of masturbation. And so what happens is that pornography and the images in pornography, I think get encoded into the ways that men think about themselves as male and as masculine. Every time I masturbate, whether I use pornography or not, it reinforces anything I might be thinking about at that time. If I'm thinking about an adult woman, then it helps me to objectify him. If I'm thinking about a kid, it not only helps me to objectify him, but it makes it all right for me to go out and molest children or rape women. This is the way many sexual deviations are created. 
through what we call masturbatory conditioning. To be honest, it has uh, opened me up for uh, a couple of more kinky areas as far as sex is concerned, uh, bondage, uh, anal sex, uh, you know, a little of the rougher sex, choking, slapping, you know, some of the stuff that you play around with, but that tends to get a little serious. You know, masturbation sort of opens that all the way up. As masturbating to either something that you see or the memory of something that you've seen before, which is very pornographic. And if this involves, for example, say a rape of a woman, and this has been very exciting and you retain it on your mind screen with the help of that epinephrine, that chemical there that locks it in, then be very easy to keep recalling that and masturbating to that. And what you're doing, in a sense, is conditioning yourself into sexual illness. And that is having a sexual deviation or preference. When they're not masturbate, those images that I masturbate to it is it's what, what determines the what I'm going to go out and do. When there was an onslaught of pornography in the 60s, President Johnson established a commission to study its effects. After a two-year investigation of spending several million dollars and interviewing social scientists from all over the world, they concluded that there was no evidence that exposure to this material is harmful to anyone. Now, the, the feminists and the religious right continue uh, to make their age-old arguments without offering any kind of support for them at all. I think that there is a cause and effect relationship between pornography and sexual abuse. This doesn't mean that pornography is the only cause of sexual abuse. It doesn't mean that every rape or every act of battery is caused by pornography. What it does mean is that there are acts of rape, acts of battery, acts of violence against women that would not happen were it not for the effect of pornography on the perpetrator. I interviewed a man who was convicted of sexually abusing girls on the bus that he drove. And what he told me is that he would often go home at night and watch the pornographic movies and look at the magazines and fantasize about the girls who he drove to school on the bus. And then he would go to work the next morning and drive the bus and look at the young girls and then fantasize about them in the context of pornography. And he talked about the way in which his fantasy life and his real sexual behavior began to blur a bit. Again, he didn't blame pornography for making him do what he did. He was able to reflect on the way in which pornography constructed a world in which sexually abusing young girls became possible for him. Guys will say uh, violence is bad, is a bad, you know, men's violence against women is a bad thing. I don't agree. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have all this rape. We shouldn't have all this battering. And it's a bad thing. And, and they'll agree. Okay, so we get a consensus. But then we'll say, okay, can we look at some of the institutions in the society that might lead to these enormous rates of violence, okay? It's, in other words, the violence doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's not some genetic thing. It's not some biological thing. And anybody who thinks that it's genetic or biological, all you have to do is point to other societies which have much, much lower rates of sexual assault. Pornography doesn't instigate, provoke, or, or, or provide insanity, you know? When you start bringing them up and saying, okay, let's look at the media. Let's look at pornography. Let's look maybe at the sports culture. In each of those cases, when you start bringing these things up, guys who just five minutes before had said, yeah, we think that, that rape and battering and sexual harassment are bad things and we, sh we should do something about them. The same guys often are then saying, wait a second, there's nothing about, it's not about pornography. That's not, it's not the issue. Pornography leads to violence against women. How, how would you respond to that? That, 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 that bugs me. That bugs me. Uh, it doesn't. And then they start re oftentimes re resorting to things like, the men who do these things are crazy. There's crazy people. Not everybody's the same. There's crazy people. The crazy people, you know, they're crazy and they're going to do whatever they want because they're If crazy. that was true, what that means is that our society is absolutely crazy because that, that means that there's millions of men walking around who are crazy because there's so many men walking around who are assaulting women or who have assaulted women. You have to be a sick one to begin yeah, with. It doesn't sick. matter if, you, if you've got pornography or not. I mean, if you're that sick, you're seeing pornography yeah. in, your, in, in your vision. It's not helpful or useful at all to think of this in terms of crazy men going off and doing these things. I think, I think the men who, do, who commit these crimes are a lot more normal than they are crazy. It's true. It's much easier to think that it's Freddy Krueger, it's some sicko who's out there cre creating the violence and, and attacking girls and women. But 
in fact, it's not true. The, the, the average rapist um, looks like me or looks like any other guy. The way the pornography related to um, my, my conviction, it's just a progression. I mean, it starts out with the age, and the age just starts decreasing and decreasing, and you start looking for different physical characteristics, and had a lot to do with it. It jumped me right into a cycle. Um, just started a whole trigger of events for me. And I planned out what I, to be left alone no. with the 10 year old stepdaughter. Stop Her mom it. took off to church no. and I stayed home that night and I coerced her into um, performing oral sex on me. Um, I, to sum it up, basically I raped her. All I can speak for is myself and I know that it wasn't good for me. I lived a good life being raised. I lived a religious background. I know what it did for me, and it did not help. It just it derailed my life. The argument that there is no proof uh, that pornography causes violence is, is really wrong, and the proof exists in many different areas. There have been a great many scientific studies in university laboratory situations exposing men to pornography and then measuring their changes of attitudes, their reactions, their willingness to rape, their willingness to uh, commit acts of aggression against women. I mean, this research has been going on a very long time. And virtually all of it shows that with what these researchers call aggressive pornography, by which they sometimes mean pornography that is violent, and they sometimes mean pornography that is simply brutal, uh, that men's attitudes towards women and their willingness to commit acts of violence against women um, change to the point where they, they are more willing to do things that were unthinkable to them before they were exposed to the pornography. There's another area of, of information that is always um, treated with incredible condescension and trivialization. It's called anecdotal evidence. And that means that it actually happened to somebody and they know about it and they will tell you about it. Do you think it's harmful? Yeah, I do. Because my father, um, he molested my sister and he's been looking at that stuff since he was a kid. And he's right, right now he's going to the courts and stuff and he, he should be going to prison within the next two weeks. Um, well, actually he just tried to force himself on me. And like when I like clean or something, he'll just come up to me like behind me and grab my chest. He's like usually on Sundays, me and him would usually just stay at home and like kind of he'd go in his bedroom for a long time. And then he'd come out when I was cleaning, and then he'd start trying to do the whole thing. I guess whatever he was doing wasn't enough to satisfy himself. And. Like pornography, like helped it kind of. Now, if you want to think about uh, Solzhenitsyn, his testimony about the Soviet Gulag as being anecdotal evidence, that's fine. And if you want to think that what Eli Wiesel has told us about the concentration camps is anecdotal evidence, that's fine. That's the kind of evidence that we get from women who say, pornography was used on me in this and this and this and this way. My father began abusing me sexually when I was five. I checked that out with him a few years ago. He told me that it began around then, too. He'd come home um, often with pictures um, of women in um, sexual situations with other women, other men, or animals. I was abused by him until I was 13 years old. And my abuse was um, a lot of oral sex and other kinds of, of things that, that he would do, you know, touching me anywhere and everywhere and penetrating me with fingers, things like that. And what I realized from from my own personal life experience and the personal life experience of many, many, many other uh, women and men that I've talked to. There's no question in my mind that pornography and sexual abuse and sexual assault, um, that there's a strong connection. I watched my own father 
become aroused and get excited by the pornography and then act out on what he, he was looking at. Yeah, let me show you some of the other ones. The police actually have a lot of proof. Poli the FBI, police in various areas. Oftentimes when we do investigations involving individuals who target children for sexual purposes, we do search warrants and find various kinds of pornography in their residence or hidden away at some other location. On September 4th, 1998, I was assigned as the lead investigator in the homicide of Elizabeth Sinclair. Elizabeth was five years old and she was strangled to death by her 17-year-old babysitter, David Case. In the investigation, we learned that David Case had over 700 sexually explicit images that he had downloaded off the internet. Elizabeth was my five-year-old daughter who was raped, sodomized, and then strangled by her 17-year-old babysitter who was um, a friend of the family. We had known him since he was three years old. I think probably one of the biggest contributing factors to what happened was um, through the course of the investigation, they found out that he was real heavy into child pornography um, and other forms of pornography. They found uh, numerous uh, pictures of, of children um, with children and children with adults on his, that he had downloaded off the internet. In David Case obtaining the photograph of the victim, Elizabeth, and placing it in with other uh, hardcore pornography, child pornography pictures, he began fantasizing or he was placing her in the same category as he was, uh, as these other photographs. So he was fantasizing about um, committing those acts with Elizabeth at that time. So I truly believe that if pornography wasn't involved, if David didn't have access to it or the, the free access through the internet to the pornography, um, there's a good chance that this homicide would not have occurred. I guess the hardest part of this whole thing is, is knowing that she was five years old and that she was taken from this world in a very violent and cruel way. Um, she was a very delightful child. She was very sweet. She did not know what a stranger was. She was very loving and she was the light of my life and she's not here now. It's very striking that pornography is a part of so many of these crime scenes that the police find. Um, and then finally, I think very, this is very important. We actually have the testimony of lots of men who have committed uh, sexual abuse. What had happened is I had been looking at pornography and, and, and thinking about pornography and I was walking across the uh, college campus and I seen this lady pull up and park her car. So I got in her car and hid out in the back of her car, and then when uh, she came back out, I came up over the back seat and put a knife to her throat. I uh, had these images in my mind of, of the girls that I had seen in the magazines, and uh, I uh, forced this woman to uh, perform oral sex on me, which I had seen being done in the magazines. I had a, a real vivid image of the girls had smiles on their faces and stuff like that. And when, uh, even though the woman that I was raping was crying, to me, I had these, these pictures implanted in my mind. And I didn't see, see the, the, the pain and, and, and the anger and, and the, the hate that I was putting her through. All I could see was these smiling faces. There's more current research that shows that even the pornography that doesn't involve violence, not the so-called aggressive pornography, but the objectifying pornography, the Playboy and Penthouse kind of pornography, um, that, that that also changes men's attitudes in a very negative way towards women and their willingness to act out violence on women. It wasn't really hardcore pornography, but it, it was, uh, I think it was like Penthouse, and uh, uh, that style of pornography, Hustler. And I was, I was, I was trying, I remember I was trying to get you know what I saw? my victims I to enjoy it like I was. I think she's pretty. And Thank you. give them the mindset, well, look how good this is. Doesn't this look good? Don't you just love it? Oh, yeah. I felt like it gave me 
you know, two guys can do that. A little bit more ability to do a little more explicit acts with my victims than if I wouldn't have had it. Um, I'm glad you got to look at this. To prolong the assault? Yeah, I, I remember like that. It? Yeah. Cool. That it did prolong a yeah, lot of the I assaults. I'll bring them over and we can look at them together. It made it more intense. I okay. think you'd like that? A lot yeah. more intense. It made it more violent, too. Violent in the way I didn't care. I didn't care what I did to anybody. We know from research in 12 cities all across America that the sex crimes and violent crimes increase significantly in the area where these sex shops go in adult bookstores, X rated theaters, uh, etc. Research at Kingston Penitentiary. In Ontario, Canada, by William Marshall, revealed that 86% of the rapists admitted that their primary interest was regular use of hardcore pornography. How would you describe hardcore? Just up and bitch smacking. <laughs> Just you know, hardcore skin skin whacking. Violent crime in America against women is at epidemic proportions. The molestation rate of children is at epidemic proportions. My brother-in-law always had pornographic books. He always had the magazines. He would show both myself, my sister, um, these dirty books of men and women having sex. He was always at the, at the adult bookstores. And I, I believe he was looking at these things every single day. It's like every female in our family wasn't safe around him because he did go on to abuse my sisters, um, my niece, my own daughters he abused, his sister-in-law, her children. Nobody was safe around him. He was addicted to the pornography, and I think this is why he was so perpetual in his victimizing everybody. I think that my brother-in-law thought I was equivalent or would respond in the same way that the women on the pages of the pornographic magazines, the way that they looked, that they were erotic or aroused or enjoyed it. And I think he firmly believed that, that I welcomed his advances towards me, that I wanted him to touch me, that I would really enjoy it once he was able to get his hands on me. It's clear that the most disturbing issue of pornography has to be its long-term effect on society. And if you think that pornography is too prevalent now, well, just wait. Virtual reality, digital delivery systems, interactive TV, they are all on the horizon. Currently, we have millions of young men consuming hardcore pornography on a daily basis. As they get older, how is this going to affect their relationships with women? And the larger question, how will it affect the community? I've just seen, you know, ch just children, just young, young, really young girls getting it every which way. Like uh, how old? Like 12, 10. No younger than 10, though. Is it a turn on? Yeah, I think so. I'm not a pedophile or anything, it's just really sexy. <laughs> but you might consider sex with, say, like a 14 year old or. Oh, I've had sex with a 14 year old. What will the future hold for women? who are raised in a society where they are dehumanized by a multi-billion dollar pornography industry. An industry that portrays them as sexually aroused by humiliation, exploitation, and molestation. As a child, I just hid out inside myself. And what that meant was, in school, my, my entire grade school experience was about trying not to be seen I remember being on the playground, for example, and watching other children playing, but I couldn't really play. Just couldn't play. The assumption for me, and I'm not alone, is that I was so bad, I was so tainted, that I couldn't let anybody know. The abuse made me feel like it was all my fault, like I was a freak. I felt totally different and isolated from everybody. I couldn't be near people. If I saw somebody coming that I knew, I would turn and walk the other way. I would run away from people. Her self-esteem is just in the gutter. She doesn't leave the house. She just watches the TV. 
it's ruined her life in a lot of ways. I mean, she's not the active, happy girl that she was. I think that the best way to put it is you put a hole, I put, I put a hole in her soul. As a society, we have yet to reach a consensus regarding the effects of pornography or what we should do about it. On the other hand, the pornography industry isn't waiting around for our verdict. They will continue to mainstream their products into our communities. They will continue to wield more social and political power with their enormous profits. They will continue to disavow any responsibilities for harm caused by their actions, and they will continue to profit from the dehumanization of women and children. Already one out of every four women are sexually abused by the age of 20. What's that worth? What are the consequences if we continue to allow pornography to saturate our communities and influence our children? of divorce and I think there is more pain over this among unmarried people and among married people who are still suffering from this pain in their premarital years than over just about any other single cause I think it's the root of a lot of other problems they say the suicide rate is higher for sexually active teenagers bulimia most often begins at the breakup of the first sexual relationship this isn't healthy this isn't safe and you know what really bugs me? It really bugs me when they say, here, honey, just use a condom. Because you know what they're saying? They're saying, look, just don't get pregnant, just don't get diseases. As long as you don't get pregnant, as long as you don't get diseases, I don't care what happens to you emotionally. That's not my problem, it's not my department, it's not my business. That is not loving you. That is not looking out for what's best for you. I want more for you than that. I don't want you to get pregnant when you're not married, when you're not ready for it. I don't want you to get sexually transmitted diseases. But more important than that, I want you to find and to live and to experience real love. And you know, I honestly believe, I honestly believe that a return to chastity, a return to a respect for the language of sexuality is the only way we're gonna get that love back. The only way. This is why I traipse all over the country giving talks about it, because I think it's good news. Chastity is freedom for you. It's freedom to get out of relationships that aren't working out, so you can find the absolute best relationship for you. It's freedom to become the absolute best you you can be. These are very important years for you. You are becoming the person you're going to be for the rest of your life. You're laying the foundation of talents, of abilities, of habits. This is a great time for you. And it's a great time for you to be excelling, to be pursuing excellence. But you know, we get tempted to cop out. We get tempted, instead of becoming it, to marry it, or to want to marry it, or to want to attach to it sexually. We, we're insecure and we're afraid to navigate the world on our own terms, so we just link up with somebody else. And it doesn't work. This is your time to be becoming a whole person in your own right. To be becoming independent or interdependent. This is not a time for you to be addicted to another person. It's going to hold you back. It's going to hurt you. That's not that you can't love. But if we love chastely, if we love freely, we're still free to become what we need to become. That's why I'm excited about chastity. Because it's freedom to find and to live real love. And that's what we need. That's what we're looking for. Real, honest love. And it's very normal to worry. Am I all right? Am I all right sexually? Is there something wrong with me? Am I normal? 
And I basically say this. No, you are not normal. You're not. Anybody under about 24 years old is just not normal. And that's not to be insulting or difficult. It's just to say your hormonal systems aren't through developing yet. You've got quarts and quarts of hormones flying around your body with absolutely nowhere to land. And to be perfectly honest, they're bored. And because they're bored, they like to mess with you. Ha, let's make her attracted to that today. Wah, wah. Ha, that was fun. Let's make her cry for a week. Oh, yeah, this is great. Wasn't that cool? I love being a hormone. This is so fun. But the trick is not to worry. The trick is to get those drives under the control of our brains so that we can choose to be loving people. You will not be able to be a loving person. You will not be able to be a loving spouse until you get your drives under the control of your brain. You just won't be able to. Because sex has to be at the service of love, not the other way around. It has to be under control. And you will not be able to attract the kind of person who has their drives under control unless you do. Like follows like. If you want to find a confident person, if you want to find a really loving person, if you want to find an in-control person, you need to be those things. Because that's what they're going to be looking for. You need to be under control the same way they're under control. Now, what about somebody who says, look, honey, you would if you loved me. If you loved me, you'd sleep with me. If you loved me, you'd have sex with me. Do they love you? No. And I'm not just talking about guys pressuring girls here. I want to be very clear about that. This works both ways. And I'd say it works both ways, probably in about the same proportions, about the same percentage of the time. Somebody who's pressuring you does not love you. And you don't owe them a little 30-word essay, why my virginity is important to me. Because people like to argue, and they like to convince you that if you're not winning the argument, then you must be wrong. You only owe them a no. I know the question on everybody's mind because it was on my mind. All right. So this chastity thing sounds lovely. What exactly does it mean? What exactly are we talking about here? Now, OK, avoiding intercourse, OK, I can deal with that. Um, what else? How close can I get? How far can I go? How close can I drive to the edge of the cliff without falling off? What exactly does this mean for me? Does this mean I can do all those other things as long as I don't have technically have intercourse, I'll be fine? Eh. Chastity is about understanding the difference between affection and passion. Affection's a good thing. No one's saying that you should be cold. But what's passion? Passion is that point in affection when your body says, hey, I just thought of something. We could have sex. <laughs> Wouldn't that be kind of fun? Don't you think that'd be neat? It's at that point when you pretty much need to stop, you pretty much need to go somewhere else. Go shoot some hoops. Go to Denny's. <laughs> Do something kind of public. Because what we're talking about here is love. And is it really loving someone to say, I love you so much, I'm going to make you want something really, really bad, and then I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> That's not loving. That's not looking out for what's best for somebody. Now, when it comes down to this, we have this little problem known as sexual peak. Are you familiar with this Masters and Johnson type term? Sexual peak. Sexual peak doesn't mean when sex is best. It just means the point at which you are the most easily aroused. When does sexual peak occur for males? 18. When does it occur for females? Around the age of 35. Do you see a little potential for problem here? You got two people in the car. She's scheduled to reach her sexual peak in about 19 years. He's scheduled to reach his sexual peak uh, right about now. She's saying, this is just so warm and wonderful, and I could just hold you and cuddle you for hours and hours and hours, because this is so nice. And meanwhile, he's having a very different kind of response. And each one thinks the other's thinking what they're thinking. Of course, what starts to happen when you get into college is the flip side, is the women start saying, oh, whoa, whoa, that's what people were talking about. Oh, OK. It's important to understand that just because something's going on with you doesn't mean that's what's going on with somebody else. Now, you've all heard that old term, petting. 
basically means messing with the parts of someone else's body that would have been covered by a bathing suit that was manufactured before 1964. <laughs> Chastity means that by definition, those parts are off limits. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, risk. Sexually transmitted disease, there's definite risk at that level. Bonding, oxytocin is flowing at that level. It is being produced. Clouding is occurring at that level. The other is a little less tangible. If you're saving sex for marriage, it's going to be the language you speak with your spouse. It's going to be your special language, your special intimate language. Now, you wouldn't like the thought of your spouse having sex with someone else. You wouldn't like the thought of your spouse remembering sex with someone else. Gee, honey, that was really great. That was even better than the way Linda did it. You wouldn't like that. But what about all of this? What about what's known as foreplay? What if you're, uh, you're married, you come home one night, you walk into your bedroom, your spouse is in bed naked with the neighbor. You're a little irritated. All right? But what if they roll over and say, oh, no, honey, hi. It's not what it looks like. See, we're not going to go all the way. Would you say, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Oh, well, just go right ahead. Just, just don't let me bother you. I'll, I'll just be in the living room reading the paper. Just, just let me know when you're done. Would you do that? I don't think so. This is all the language of marriage. And saving it means saving all of it. It means saving it as a language, as a package, as a gift. The whole realm of this arousal behavior. Now, you still want to know exactly how far you can go, of course. And I'm not going to answer it for you. You are. You're going to answer your own question in the form of a story. All right? Bear with me. You are all guys. My apologies. You're all guys. For the next minute, you're all guys. All right? You're a guy. You're a guy, and you've just met the most incredible woman you've ever met in your life. And she is beautiful, and she's your best friend, and she's your soulmate, and you talk for hours and hours and hours, and you fall in love with her. And you propose, and she says yes, and you get married. And she gets pregnant. And you are in the hospital room, and you're the first one to see and to hold your little baby girl. And you just can't believe what a little miracle she is. And she looks just like your wife, only she has your nose and kind of a little bit of your chin. And sh this little bundle came from your love. This little person came from your love for your wife. And you just can't believe how much you love her. And you bring her home from the hospital. And your wife dresses her in frilly little dresses and tapes bows to her head because she doesn't have enough hair. And she learns to walk, and she walks like little kids where they just keep falling and catching themselves, you know, until they finally fall all the way. And she picks flowers in the backyard, and she brings them in, and she gives them to Daddy. And when she learns to talk, she says, Dad, Dad. And she's Daddy's little girl, and when she's crying, Daddy makes her feel better. And then she goes to first grade, and you take her to school, and she's crying the first day because she's scared, and she doesn't want you to leave. But she comes home at the end of the day, and she's all excited because she made an I backwards L, love you, Daddy card. And then she's in fourth grade, and she's taking piano lessons, and she really wants you to come to the recital, so you get off work early, and you go to the recital, and she wrote a song, and she dedicated it to you. And she's all happy, and she's smiling because she sees you out in the audience. And then she's in ninth grade, and she has a date with a senior who drives a van. You tell me. How far is too far? How far do you want Mr. Senior with a van to go with your little girl? Do you want him to do absolutely everything he can get away with without technically having intercourse? I don't think so. I asked this question once a girl said, not out of the driveway, man. A guy just yesterday said, holding hands, that's way too far. You are living chastity when you treat your dates the way you want Mr. Senior with a van to treat your little girl. Period. That's it. That's love. That's looking out for what's best for the other person. That's it. That's your standard. Now I want to make one more extremely important point. Sex has physical consequences, it has emotional consequences, and also has spiritual consequences. St. Paul said, do not deceive yourselves, no fornicator will enter into the kingdom of heaven. I told you this is your choice. This is your decision. The church is not going to say, we know you're in there sinning. 
But Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He never said some of my followers follow my commandments and some of my followers don't. So this is really a part of the decision to follow Jesus Christ. But what does that say then? What does that say to people who've already done it? Oh, sweetheart, I'm sorry, you blew it. <laughs> I'm sorry. God hates you now. We need to be very, very clear that God is absolutely, madly in love with you at every moment of your existence. He doesn't love you more when you're being good and less when you're being bad. When we sin, we turn away from him. But it's us turning away, not him. So what we need to do isn't say, oh darn, I turned away from God. Why did I turn away from God? That was really stupid of me to turn away from God. What we need to do is turn back. Have you seen the movie Jesus of Nazareth? It's incredible. There's this great scene in the middle where Jesus is having dinner with the Pharisees. It's like being in an embassy, all right, a very important place. And they're having this very theological discussion about loving your neighbor and who is my neighbor. And Mary Magdalene comes screaming in. Mary Magdalene is depicted as a prostitute, all right? And she comes in screaming and crying, and they're trying to throw her out. And, you know, Jesus is a very important person, and, and, and she's yelling, and they're calling her names, and Jesus had let her stay. And she's at his feet, crying and crying and crying, the way you cry when you know you've done something really wrong, and you're really sorry. And he looks at her with this absolutely amazing look of love, and he says, your sins, and I know they are many, are forgiven you because of your great love. Go and sin no more. You guys, that's the way he looks at you. That's the way he looks at each and every one of us when we go to him and we say, I am so sorry. I'm going to try so hard not to let this happen again. I'm weak. Help me. Help me to be strong. Help me not to do this again. He takes us back. He loves us. What we're talking about here today is chastity, not necessarily virginity. Virginity refers to the past, and it cannot be changed. I don't want to downgrade virginity. It's beautiful. But it refers to the past, and it cannot be changed. Chastity is about the future. And anyone, anyone can have a chaste future, regardless of their past. Anyone can make a decision that from here on out, I'm going to live chastity. I don't want to hear about anyone leaving this room today and saying, well, it was a good talk, but it's too late for me. It is not too late for you. It is never too late for you. It's not too late for you if you're married. Because married people need to live chastity too. It's more fun for them. But we all need to live respect for the language and the beauty of sexuality. We all do. So I encourage you today to make that decision. If you haven't already done so, think about it. I can't make you. I'm not going to follow you home. I'll be on an airplane going somewhere else. Write yourself a letter about what you heard today and what it means. And if you make this decision, which I encourage you to, to live chastity from here on out, it's going to take a little planning. It doesn't happen automatically. Don't date people who don't share your standards. Don't waste your time. Spend your time becoming the best you you can so that you will attract the best other that you can. Become a confident person so that you will attract confident people. Become a confident person so that you don't need to be attached to somebody, so that you can be free, so that you can be whole. Date smart. Don't get into tempting situations and think you'll be very, very strong and get out of them, because you won't. We're not made that way. We're made to shut down. Our brains shut down. Same goes for drinking. Don't drink and date. You know, I can't tell you the hundreds of girls I have cried with, girls who never intended to lose their virginity until they were married, went to a party, got drunk, lost their virginity. This goes for guys, too. They just don't cry with me, but I know what happens. Alcohol shuts your brain down. That's what it does. And they say, oh, I was such a bad person. I thought I was a good person, but now I found out I'm a bad person. I said, no, you weren't. You were a drunk person. And you did what drunk people do. Drunk people have no brain. They just have drive. And drive knows what? Drive knows pizza love, period. Drive knows want what I want when I want it. Keep your brain. Especially when you're in dating situations, you're going to need all the brain you can get. You're going to need all the self-control you can get. So hang on to it. Date smart. Watch the way you dress. It's very simple. People say, what's modesty? What's modest, what's not? It's very simple. If the way you're dressed makes a person look at you and say, what an attractive person. I'd like to get to know that person better. You're modest. If the way you're dressed makes a person look at you and the very first spontaneous thought that pops into their brain is sex, you're not. It's very simple. 
Me, I'd much rather have somebody look at me and say, wow, she's very attractive, I'd like to get to know her better, than have them look at me and think, who oh, I'd like to have a piece of that, you know? <laughs> it's just not very attractive. Most importantly, if you want to live this way, stay close to God. You're going to need all the help you can get, and he provides it. He really does. He loves you. He's the author of love. He created love. He knows how it works. Take advantage of that. This strength is not going to come from you alone. If you try to live this with the strength coming from you alone, I give you two weeks. You're going to need help. You're going to need strength. Chastity is like a muscle. We get stronger at it. We get better every time we use it. Every time you say no, and it's really, really difficult to say no, every time you walk away, you're going to get a little stronger. It's a victory. And the, it's, like, it's like lifting weights, and the weight never gets any lighter, but as your muscle gets stronger, it gets easier to lift it. And as you've got the Holy Spirit standing behind the barbell, all of a sudden it's really easy. Oh, I can do this, yeah. Really, pray daily. Pray specifically for chastity. Pray for an understanding of it. Pray for the strength to live it. You know, one of my very favorite quotes from Scripture is John, chapter 16, verse 9. Christ said to his disciples, You live in my love when you keep my commandments, just as I keep the Father's commandments and live in his love. I tell you this, that my joy may be your joy, and that your joy may be complete. What I've learned, what I've found, is that living God's laws isn't just about jumping through a lot of hoops so I can get into heaven. It's about living my life according to the instruction manual. It's about living the way I made. And it works. Because he made me, he knows. It's about finding joy and finding happiness. Living chastity isn't just about jumping through a bunch of hoops so you won't get sexually transmitted diseases, so you won't get pregnant. Living chastity is not just about avoiding sexually transmitted disease and avoiding pregnancy. I want that for you. I don't want you to get pregnant. I don't want you to get sexually transmitted diseases. But more important than that, what I want for you is real love. I want you to find and to experience real love in your lives. I honestly believe that the best way to do that, the only way to do that, is to live real love, is to get our drives under control, and to live and practice real chastity. That's what I want for you. So most importantly, really, live love. Love each other. Know that I really do love all of you, and I really pray for all of you every day. Go out and live this. Thank you very much. And so the parent has sent a message and has communicated that life is like luck. Maybe you will, maybe you don't. Not what's the will of the Father. Not how does God operate. Now, what should he have said? He should have come home and said, guess what happened today? I paid for this and I, they gave me $7.52 too much. And then I thought about, this doesn't belong to me. It would be stealing me to take from somebody what doesn't belong to me. And besides that, $7.52 is not worth sleeping with a guilty conscience today and tomorrow and next week. And every time I go in that store, and every time I see that person, it's going to be on my mind. Son, sweetheart, don't ever steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Because you know what? It'll mess up your conscience. And you want to be able to sleep good every night. You think those kids won't remember that? Yes, they will. They will remember. And you either communicate what is good or you communicate what is destructive. Now, for example, here's a father who's always making comments about women. And he makes comments about how they dress. If they, if they dress seductively, he may make some comment about that. Or he may make a comment about their appearance. They're too thin or too fat or they're too this or too that. And so the daughter's sitting there while the father's just voicing his careless and indifferent opinion about women. What's his daughter thinking? Maybe she's about 12 or 13, or maybe she's 10 or 11. And what she's hearing is, what she's hearing is this. My father doesn't like certain kind of women. Or my father is attracted to certain kind of women. 
And one thing for certain, if my father's going to keep liking me, I better not gain one pound. Or if I'm going to have my father's attention, I need to dress a little bit more to get some attention. What's the consequence? The consequence is this. Whether she has her father's attention or not, she's going to get a man's attention. And she's going to begin unconsciously to begin to dress a little bit more seductively to get some guy's attention. Because you know what? If this is what our father likes, must be what men like. And if that's what men like, that's what I'm going to do. And besides that, I know what my father likes. And I certainly want to be pleasing to my father. And so therefore, this is, this is, what, this is what I'm going to do. Now, she may not sit down and reason that out. But in her subconscious mind, she's going to begin to respond to what she thinks pleases her father and what she heard her father say. And I had a young lady say to me, my father kept talking about being overweight, being overweight, being overweight, and, her daughter, and this gal ended up anorexia. Why? I was so afraid to gain one pound of weight because my father, I could not stand his comments and I could not stand that he didn't like me. What I want you to see is this. The mistakes and the things we communicate, they don't die the day you communicate them. They go on. They have lasting consequences that are devastating in people's lives. Now, what should that father say? Well, first of all, the father should be careful what he says about women, period. And if he's looking the wrong way, should keep him to himself and talk to God about it. And certainly not comment about how a person looks or how they don't look in such a way to be critical. Because the truth is, every woman and every man is different. God created us all different. So you don't make comments that are very, shall we say, critical or demeaning in some way that causes a son or daughter to think less than a person simply because of the way they're shaped or the way they look. That has nothing to do with character. We're all different. They're godly people in all shapes and sizes. But what you communicate, that child is going to accept as law in their life because the last thing they want is their parents' disfavor. Then, of course, for example, here is the son or the daughter, and uh, let's say that, for example, the dad's working on the lawnmower. Now, nobody likes to work on lawnmowers. I understand that. And so the son comes on. He says, Dad, I want to help you fix that. Now, look, just leave this alone. You don't know anything in the world about lawnmowers. Just get lost, son. Or the daughter walks in the kitchen, and mom's cooking, and she's got a whole bunch of pots and pans out, and she's just, and the daughter says, Mom, I, I want to help you. I want you to teach me how to cook. I don't have time to teach you how to cook. You'll learn to cook later in life, but just, just go do something else. I'm busy now. Mom, what message did you send? I don't want you with me. I'm not interested in teaching you. You're too ignorant to learn. You're too stupid to learn. You say, well, I wouldn't say, wait a minute. It's not what, listen, it's not what you meant. It's what you communicated. So how do you correct that? You say, son, hold this wrench. Oh, sweetheart, come over here and let's, let me show you how to do this. Stir this this way. You know what? They may make the biggest mess in the world. But you know what you've done? You have said to your child, you belong. You are competent. I love you. You are worth teaching. You're going to make a great wife one of these days. Son, you're going to make a, you're going to make a great mechanic. Well, he may not know duly about being a mechanic, but you know what you've done? You have included him. You've, you've helped him to be a part of your life. It's what we communicate. Then, for example, here's the father who's issuing commands always issuing commands. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Now, I want you to do it right now. And so all of us have said, well, why? It doesn't make any difference why. I said do it, therefore do it. Now, the father's communicated an edict. But what the child heard was, I don't deserve to know why. I must not be worth much that I can't even, I, I'm not even counted worthy of at least an explanation. And so what gets communicated is frustration and anxiety. It creates, oh, listen, it creates eventually rebellion in the heart of that child. 
want to do what's right, want to do their best, want to do all that they can. Then what about, for example, that parent who doesn't discipline the child, and the child comes home at school, they can watch all the TV they want. Uh, they can get in, the, in all the candy they want. Uh, they can eat when they want, when they want it, what they want. Give them a credit card, give them money. The message is, I don't care what you do, just stay out of my way. Just don't bother me. And so the child reads, I don't count. I'm probably better off outside of this family. They don't love me because, because you see, a child wants to be disciplined. And so the child gets communicated this message. They don't care about my future. They don't care about what I learn or don't learn. They don't care about what happens to me. They don't even care enough. They, my father doesn't even care enough to discipline me, knowing that I'm doing the wrong thing. He just wants me out of his way, just stay out of his way. Don't take up his time. It sends a horrible message. We wonder why we have a generation of children who are angry, who are bitter and resentful and hostile, and who are out there doing everything they possibly can to find somebody who cares. Some peer join anything, immorality, you name it, doesn't make, want to feel belonging, want to feel loved, want to feel accepted, want to feel that somebody cares about them. You know why? Because at home, the communication was, don't get in my way. You're not important. You do whatever you want to do. You do whatever you choose to do, but just don't bother me. Just, just stay out of my way. A horrible message. And then we wonder why they get in trouble. We wonder why they have the friends they have. We wonder why they go through the heartache and the pain. And we wonder why they get into the kind of trouble that brings such embarrassment upon the parents. Why? Because you didn't care enough to say to them, I love you enough to discipline you. I love you enough that I want you to be what you ought to be. And I love you enough to take the time to help you to understand what life's all about. Then I think about what happens. Father doesn't listen. And the child wants to talk. The father's doing something else. And so the son or the daughter says, you're not listening. Well, I don't have time to listen right now. What is he doing? Not really doing anything, just not listening. Or even if you're sitting at the table and you're all looking at each other, do you know what? A child knows just like that whether you're listening or not. You can look him square in the eye and they can tell you. A child can, knows whether you're listening or not. And so what you're saying by the fact that you're not listening is this. What you have to say is not important. My mind is on something else. What My name is Stella June Partlow, and I attend Oakwood College. I'm a freshman, and I'm an elementary education major and aspiring to be a teacher. Hi. My name is Victor Powell. I'm a photography major slash music minor at Oakwood College, and I'm very happy to be here. Hi. My name is Kritisa Arnett. I'm from Fort Pierce, Florida. I attend Oakwood College. I'm a biology major, and I'm so happy to be here today. Hello, my name is Edna Nore. I too am from Fort Pierce, Florida. I am a bio major, a ministerial theology and chemistry minor at Oakwood College, and it is a pleasure for me to be here today. Hi, my name is Akuya Opogubateng, and I'm from Fresno, California. I'm a biology major and a psychology minor, and I'm happy to be here today. That's, be that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. Now, um, we're all in NAPS. We're all college students. And the first thing people want to know is, how do we make time for all this uh, mission work and outreach and stuff like that? How do you organize your day and prioritize? Well, um, I think it's all about it's basic, basically pr prioritizing and keeping um, everything in perspective and keeping all your work you know, in perspective and doing as much as possible to get that work done early on time before you have missions sometimes on the weekends so you have to get everything you know in order before you leave and try to get ahead as much as possible before finals and everything comes around I think it's the same for most everyone yeah. so yes. just keeping you know all your work you know um, just done in ahead of time okay all right all right so what's what exactly is involved in doing naps what exactly do you do that takes up time um, NAPS has various um, different committees 
within it. And that's how we run the organization. For instance, there's the logistics, food committee, hospitality. They're spiritual. And when we combine all of these together, that's how we form NATS. If we didn't do this, we would be, it would be a lot of chaos. But by having these various committees, we know where, what our objectives are and what goals we want to accomplish. And also, I think it's very important that people know exactly who we are. We're the National Association for the Prevention of Starvation. And we go around and tell people about Christ. We not only share physical food for the starving, hungry people in the physical manner, but we also share it for the spiritual manner because it's where your heart is that's really important. And um, part of having, part of being in NAPS, we have to organize and we meet every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 6 a.m. <laughs> and I know for me some mornings it is just so hard but it's a thing that requires commitment mm -hmm. and you have to be responsible and when you go to bed and organize yourself just like she said er mm -hmm. um, Aquia said earlier how you have to get things done early. Mm -hmm. um, also a lot of the students back at school you know they're thinking about six o'clock in the morning oh my goodness that's so early but if when we read our Bibles we see that the Lord when he was talking to our father he woke up very early in the morning to speak to him so therefore when we're doing this we're following Christ and also it refreshes our mind for the day and so we're ready to take on the trials of the day mm -hmm. and that's why we wake up at six we have our meetings at six o'clock in the morning yeah, with every organization, they have meetings and times, you know, where they just set aside so they can plan and just get together as an organization, get together, you know, love each other up and get used to working with each other. I think that's really um, important if you're going to go out and work, especially on mission, missionary work. Mm -hmm. If you're going to work together, you're going to need to mm -hmm. be together yes. around each other, know how each other works and be, have different committees. So you're organized and you know exactly how to map out the mission and have it be successful. So we also, along with the Tuesday and Thursday meetings, we have mm -hmm. Friday night Vesper meetings. Mm -hmm. yes. And this is a time where we just commune with God and each other. <laughs> and we, you know, just you know, love each other up and just get used to each other. You know, there's a lot of people coming into NAPS, new people. You know, there's older people. I mean, the older people, we stand on their shoulders. They show us, you know, how to, they kind of train us, you know, and all the, on how everything goes. Mm -hmm. And we just need to get used to each other so the organization will be, you know, successful yes. and work good together. There's a um, play we often do. It's called the body play, and you know it shows the different parts of the body and how it all works together. Without the hand, we can't do something with the head, and that's what NAPS is all about. We're one body. You know, we're all working each individual, each group. We're all working together as a body to do God's work and allow his, to um, to do God's work and allow everything to be done for His glory. Yes. Okay. Okay. That reminds me of the text. Um, we're all members of one body, yes. and the head is yes. Jesus. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, different parts have different functions and do different things. Yeah. So you said something about committees in NAPS. Na name some of the different committees for me. Well, we have the spiritual committee, we have logistics, food committee, band, music committee, children's committee, and the list goes on. There's legal committee. <laughs> There's so many committees, and the more committed you are in the organization, the more days you're there. For <laughs> instance, <laughs> <laughs> my schedule, I'm there every day. Every day of the week there's a meeting, but it's such a joy because I'm doing service for the Lord. You know? With spiritual committee, we meet um, on Mondays and Wednesdays, usually 6 p.m., and we plan, we're the spiritual planning committee for NAPS. We plan all the, um, the foreign evangelistic meetings, um, the morning Tuesday and Thursday morning meetings. We plan the Friday night Vesper meetings, and we try and keep the spiritual aspect of NAPS together. Yeah. We probably should go around and if we're all in different committees, we yeah. can, you know, Talk say what committee it. we're in. Okay, um, I'm in two committees. I'm in the food committee and the hospitality committee. The food committee is very, very important because we know <laughs> we all need food to eat. Amen. And with the food committee, um, we have like various programs and one of the programs that stick out in mind is the Morning Star Breakfast. And that is a program where we wake up in the morning around five o'clock in the morning and we get breakfast ready for like the homeless that live under the bridge and by six o'clock the guys our naps guys they come in and they take the food and then they go and they give the food to the guys they don't just give the food and leave but they stay there and they conversate with the guys and they do this every monday and wednesday but the lord also blessed that committee because when we went to madagascar 
we were wondering, oh my goodness, we're not going to be here, so who's going to take over? And the Lord sent Mount Calvary Church, so now they're doing that program. So even if we're gone during the summer, that program will still be going on. And with the food committee, they run the food for the different various missions, or like when we're all on local missions, they prepare breakfast and lunch and dinner. And for the hospitality committee, that is very, very important because we have to follow up on all of our missions. And if we have donors or supporters, we have to send them letters and bulletins to tell them thank you. And if we stay over someone's house or, they, or if they give us food or various donations like Bibles, we always have to tell them thank you and show them our gratitude and our appreciation. So that's where that aspect of the committee is coming into Nats. Well, um... I am also, uh, like Edna, in a couple of committees myself, um, more prominently in the band committee. Um, the band is, can be compared to a bulldozer slash vacuum <laughs> kind of thing. Because um, with the band, we can get into places where you know, people can't normally get into, because it grabs attention. Um, when we go places, like for Philly, uh, for example, we went to Philly this uh, this uh, spring break, and um, there was a place, a project area called, I don't remember the name of the place, but <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a place that church members or anybody else would sense, per se, would just not go into mm -hmm. because it was uh, notorious for violence and drugs and everything else. Uh, us as NAPS, we didn't really know, nor did we, you know, think too much about it. We were like, we have a mission to do, so we're going to go do it. Mm -hmm. So we uh, brought our band. Um, we have some uh, wind players, sax, tenors, uh, I mean trumpet, trombone, and we have a drum corps. And uh, we marched, you know, right through that area, mm -hmm. you know, with the drums. People were coming out. I remember one of the guys get, uh, testified about it. So he saw people coming out in their pajamas and everything, <laughs> you know. And it, like, it sucks people out. People, when you go on knocking on somebody's door, you know, you know, just say, like, hi or whatever, lots of people, you know, either pretend they're not home, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, give no answer. But when they hear, you know, this sudden commotion, you know, they're like, what's this? Mm -hmm. So they come out to us. Mm -hmm. And it's almost devious the way it's set up because when the band, <laughs> the band goes out, you know, we break down the walls. That's the bulldozer aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And then we just suck people out like a vacuum. <laughs> and they get curious. And they're like, what's all this? And in that, you know, instant, when they come out, we're able to come back, you know, and hit them, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be, we don't immediately start out with the word, mm -hmm. usually just with a hi, hello, how are you doing, mm -hmm. you know, we're here in your area, and we just came to say, you know, Thank just you. came to see how you're doing, and usually also, we motivate the kids that come out, because we always have a lot of kids, yes. a lot of kids <laughs> that come out, and um, we usually give them a little talk about, you know, staying in school, mm -hmm. keeping away from drugs, and um, so on and so forth, so the band is very, uh, instrumental, yes. more ways than one, <laughs> in doing that kind of thing. Um, I'm also on the uh, logistics committee. Logistics is kind of like the thinkers or planners uh, mm -hmm. for supply-wise supply, supply -wise for like each committee. Um, we usually do all the packing for, uh, for the different missions we go on, whether it be weekend trips mm -hmm. or foreign, uh, foreign missions. missions and so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> We have to pack, we have to keep inventory of everything for each committee. We have to uh, run out and buy the different supplies, prepare bins, you know, for packing and shipping, and prepare posters. We uh, gather the clothes <laughs> together and uh, collect food. We have uh, food drives that we have to, um, you know, go out and pull food for the different missions and so on and so forth. So uh, logistics committee is a very, very busy committee. Mm -hmm. Very busy. Speaking of a very busy committee, we also have the Children's Committee, which I'm involved in. And children are so wonderful, you know. Um, I remember when God said, suffer the, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forgive them, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And we have to prepare children because oftentimes children are the way to leading, you know, other people. And in the children's committee, we have to plan to make sure that the kids are active and they're involved in what we do. And we meet Mondays at 6 um, p.m. We meet Tuesdays at 5 
8.15 and Sundays at 11.30. And there's a lot of us in Children's Committee and um, basically what we do is we plan programs like for foreign missions, we plan how we're going to do the whole entire foreign missions. For example, this upcoming um, summer we're going to Jamaica. So we have to do the foreign mission for Jamaica. We have to, you know, there's a lot of children. Everywhere you go, you're going to meet a lot of children. And what we do is basically we have songs. We have to pick out songs. We pick themes, right? We pick themes for the week, such as heroes of the Bible. And then we'll pick songs that go along with the theme so that they can understand. Then also we have creative ideas for them so that they have arts and crafts that go along with each story. You have a Bible verse a day. Things, so it's a teaching process. It's a fun process. It's games. And, you know, so they can understand more about Jesus. Um, we do a lot of that. We also go to various schools during our other missions, our local missions and the missions, you know, in the States. And we have to put on programs for that, you know, teaching the children about awareness of drugs and staying in school because it's so important for kids to stay in mm -hmm. school nice. and continue the education. So we have to put on programs, which we include all the other groups in because we need everyone to help us in this program. And that's basically what the Children's Committee is about. Yeah. I'm also in the children's committee, and not only do we um, not only do we just plan for foreign missions, but there's a lot of local missions that happen every single week. And yes. I know um, there's a certain town that we go to uh, Triana where we tutor the children, and that happens during the week. And then on the on Sabbath on Saturdays, we also go in and we have like a children's church mm -hmm. or that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a continually planning yes. thing. So not only do you just plan for the week, mm -hmm. you always have to be on guard, have a craft ready, have planning. And with that, since we've started Bible studies in Triana or in some of the local missions that are going on, mm -hmm. we also try to, we try to tie them together. Like we talked about the love of God with some of the people for Bible studies. We try to talk about the love of God with maybe a story or a skit, puppets, mm -hmm. different things with the children too. And so the children's committee gets around. It yes. really is very important. I forgot to mention the puppet um the puppet group we have, Puppet Ministries, which is a big influence for the kids because, you know, you bring these puppets along and they're, like, really excited. And it's really neat because it attracts the kids and it, like, helps them to become active. You know, guys, what's so important is how we all work together, yes. how we're all one body, but there's a hand and there's a mm -hmm. foot and there's, you know, eyes and ears. So with the spiritual committee, there's members from each committee on mm -hmm. that committee. Mm -hmm. We work so close with the children's committee and with the food committee because we have to make sure that everything is okay when we're playing out our sermons, how we're going to speak to the people, we go on our missions, how we're going to go door to door, conduct Bible studies, and when with whatever sermons that we're preaching during the evangelistic series it goes hand in hand with the children's ministry mm -hmm. so the children are learning the same thing on a on an easier level for them so they can, they're able to go home and tell their yes. parents and, and encourage parents others and say, Mommy, important. Daddy, guess what I learned today? Yes. They bring their parents out to meetings at night so their parents mm -hmm. get, a, mm -hmm. get some food and the yes, kids get food and it's so great how we're all able to work together and just bring more people in for God's kingdom. Yes. Wow, you guys are a living testimony. <laughs> I also noticed that we all have a name of some country or something on our t-shirts. Does this represent, you know, where we've been or where these, we're going to? These, each of our shirts have a name of where we're, we have set up a NAPS branch. And mm -hmm. it is so easy to set up a branch. Like, I'm representing California. We have a branch in L.A. And that in and of itself is a testimony. Mm -hmm. It started with, um, we went to L.A. Um, in the... It, it, L.A. is a bad, you know, it had, it had gangs and with the blood, and, right. and we came in with the love of Christ. And when you come into a town, no matter how much wickedness is in that town, mm -hmm. and you have the love of Christ, you're not walking alone. Yes. You're surrounded. Yes. So when, when they're seeing you, they're also seeing the millions and millions of angels, you know, with their yeah. bright armor and everything <laughs> behind you. And so, like, when we entered um, L.A., God just spoke for us. Um, and... We, it ended up that the gang members that were all, you know, really, really um, going through rough times and everything, they ended up helping lead out teaching other children how to use computers and the love of God. And mm -hmm. we started, they started up a branch, 
of NAPS there where they're doing work for God mm -hmm. and serving the community. Well, usually the way, one way we started a branch in Birmingham, you guys we went, remember we went to the mm -hmm. church there yeah. and we did a presentation and we showed them the video and how NAPS operates and we're talking about Madagascar and the things we did there and so many kids were excited. Well, how can we join? How can we get started? So we had a form that tells how you can get started with the NAPS branch and everything you need to do, you know, get a sponsor within your church to sponsor you for $15 mm -hmm. so you can get your t-shirt and get all your NAPS gear so that you can start going out and doing service in your community. Mm -hmm. and and then when you do the service, and they've sent the pictures back to us, they went on our website where they can go on there mm -hmm. and see all the pictures of the other NAPS branches all around the world. Yeah. And they can type in and talk to each other. That's and that's time. really great and encouraging for everyone that's in NAPS. So we yes. can always communicate and keep that unity together. Mentioning the website, um, what is so neat about it is that if um, branches in Madagascar, you can always communicate with someone that is in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And if you're in Kenya, you can communicate with someone that's in California, and you can always relate back and forth and see what each other is doing. And say, for instance, if Kenya has a project that is very successful, mm -hmm. then Madagascar, Madagascar, California can use that same project, mm -hmm. and then we all can do the same thing at the same time. And it's very fascinating how just in the instant, by a click of a button, we can find out what each other is doing in the name of the Lord. That's going to yeah. come so handy in the yes. great American yes. Your feet yes. out. <laughs> 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 to each other. And Kenya can say, well, I'm feeding this many people and all this happening. And Madagascar can come in and say, well, I'm doing this in Jamaica and Costa Rica and Guyana yes. and Ghana. Oh, it's going to be great, you guys. And when is it's it again? So when is it? November. The week of November, we're going to do this huge feed out during the week of Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's going to be great. I can't wait to hear from everybody to see what they're doing. I'm excited. Wonderful. Man. With yes. all these branches, with all these branches, we go into these places and we just, as Darla said, we go with the love of God. Yes. And there's so many branches that are on fire right now. We've been there and they have just carried on the work after we've left. Um, some, Kenya is not even funded by us. We, we usually send um, money to uh, different areas where we have left a branch so they can, you know, since they're in third world countries, it's hard for them to, you know, get money. So we try to fund them. But Kenya is on fire. They just went. They are not funded by us. We're not sending them any money. They have 70 strong in their group just going all around Nairobi just <laughs> preaching the word. And, you know, Costa Rica is doing some stuff, too. I mean, yeah, I was just thinking about that. I mean, even before we left, <laughs> before we left, they were doing stuff. I remember uh, we were working together on uh, the house for a family of nine who had a house of, uh, like, cardboard and big sheets of plastic and everything. And they were helping us um, build that house for them. But uh, before we left, uh, they, like in that same area, they found a woman who had a son that was quadriplegic and he was in a wheelchair. And um, apparently they had no ramp for him to, you know, come up and down. So he's pretty much house ridden. Mm -hmm. um, so what actually ended up happening, they, you know, that small contingent of uh, the students, they came and um, he saw that need and worked on it themselves. No naps mm -hmm. people around, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I mean, even now, you know, they're continuing the work there. Um, there's projects around Limon and, and the rest of Costa Rica that you know they've been called upon to do, and they're just on fire for God. Yeah, yeah. So Madagascar, amazing. the branch we just started in December, they're on fire. When we were there, they were so excited about the work that we were all able to do together for the Lord. And when we left, you know, 49 yeah, people were baptized. And it was so wonderful Amen. to see so many souls going down and coming up new yes. with Christ. And we, we heard, we got word from them, they're going to, 20, 23 more? Yeah. 23 yeah. more are going to yeah. be baptized in April. Mm -hmm. And that's so exciting. They're just on fire over there. They're going around, they're feeding, they're, they're cleaning houses, they're, yeah. they're just doing so much, so, so much. And it encourages us to know that so many people around the world are just working hand in hand. And that's just so great, you know? Do you know in Guyana, there's one of the girls, her name is Leah, and she's 17 years old. And with the rest of the NAPS, bran the NAPS branch in Guyana, they're going all around and they're feeding the homeless. And it's wonderful because before, they would just walk by the homeless. But now, they're going out to them, they're hugging them up, hugging them up and giving them food. And they're going in to one of the, the small villages that are cannibals, and they're going in and they're spreading the word. And do you guys know that 39 of those people got Baptized, Amen. Nine Amen. of them Amen. added to the kingdom. Praise that is Lord. so great. Yes. That's so that that is great. Just, yes. That is just the greatest joy. I mean, that's the main emphasis when we when we come into naps. You know, it's just you think about those souls. Yes, you yes. have the burden for the souls. You just go into these places, and that's the main thing on your mind. You go there, and you're just like you have to just think about the souls that you're gonna win when you go, and everything Jesus, else yes. is just 
second. <laughs> it's just secondary. You think about those souls and everything. You have no problem sacrificing anything yes. because you just think about those souls. Amen. Also, we have in you know United States, right? Philadelphia. Speaking of you know seeking the souls and everything <laughs> like that. I mean, there's a church. Um, Germantown Church and the young people in the Germantown Church they've already gotten their own little branch yeah, that's wonderful. and they want to seek the soul so much they're going out of their church mm -hmm. into the parks and everything and they're having you know church in the park so oh that everybody God. can come yeah. you imagine the baptisms that are going to happen from <laughs> that and, I mean, and you know they're even having a march for um, I'm not sure what it's against but they're having a march so that people become more aware also and that's just such a blessing yes. Amen. Amen. And speaking of blessings, this summer we're going to California. Um, I'm really excited about California because that's my home and everything. And we're just going to be going from all the way from Sacramento, Sacramento, yes, all the way down to San Diego. And we're just going to be spreading the love of God. We're going to be call portering during the week to just um, raise funds for our needs and to, for, for survival. And we're going to be, you know, doing an evangelistic meeting in um, Oakland, the Bay Area. And this is just going to be great. We're working with Bobby Mitchell and Virgil Childs, the pastors there. Yeah. And we're working with the school Golden Gate. Um, I guess the Go Golden Gate school is going to be closed down. It's academy. And it's going to be closed down. We're working there trying to um, keep it up, you know, keep it going. And we're working in the inner cities. We're working with drugs and gangs and the kids there. And it's just going to be a blessing. Yeah. Um, what am I missing? Um, we're going all the way down to L.A. We're going to be working in L.A. too, having evangelistic meetings. We're going to go through the camp meetings. We're just going to just blow up everything. The schools, we're going to public schools doing um, awareness there. And it's just, we're, it's, we're going just to motivate the youth. We're just going to fire up everyone. So we'll have, you know, the branches. We're going to have some branches in California by the time we leave. And we're just going to be we're having marches and everything. Speaking of marches, we're marching the light of God everywhere we go, right? Yes. yes. Right? Yes. So that's our main goal. Actually, that's our theme song. Yes. 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 Yeah. And so one of, the, one of the tools of NAPS is we um, sing the song in different languages in the country that we go to. Yes. yes. So we could sing, we are marching mm -hmm. in English and... Malagasy. Malagasy. Since we just came from Madagascar. Yes. Okay. Right. Let's sing it. Let's sing it, guys. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching. We are marching. We are marching, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching. We are marching. So very beautiful. Yeah. Well, let's see. Today we've learned about 6 a.m. meetings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that we don't just jump on the plane, everybody with a blue shirt, let's go to Jamaica. Uh -huh. There's organization, we have mm -hmm. committees, mm -hmm. and we uh, try to connect with the people with love and in their own language. Yes. yes. We've learned about the Great American Feed Out. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. All, how all the NAPS branches communicate yes. and work together, and we all can go off on our own and different things like that. Um, what's the most important thing, somebody answer real quick, about starting a NAPS branch? I think the most important <laughs> thing that we must always remember is that God is always 
the head yes. of everything we yes. do. He's the provider, the supporter. He's going to give us everything you need. And all you've got to do is be committed, do everything you can mm -hmm. possibly can, but make sure that God is first. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you all, each and every one of you, for coming out. For representing three <laughs> different committees, the band and the children's mm -hmm. committee, mm -hmm. all the different countries, Kenya and Madagascar, yeah. California, Jamaica, Jamaica, <laughs> Guyana, and all the other branches we have around the country and around the world. Um, you guys have demonstrated the love of Christ to me and to all those at home. We want to thank everybody for joining us, listening to us. Uh, please uh, feel free to try to communicate with us. Thank you for uh, all your time. And God bless and take care. I dreamed that the great judgment morn had dawned and the trumpet had blown I dreamed that the nations had gathered to judgment before the white throne from the throne came a bright shining angel and stood on the land and the sea and he swore with his hand raised to heaven that time was no longer to be and and wailing as the lost were told of their fate they cried to the rocks and the mountains they prayed but their prayer man was there but his money had melted and vanished away a pauper he stood in the judgment his debts were too heavy to pay the great man was there but his greatness when death came was left far behind and the angel that opened his record not a trace of his greatness could find the more man came to the judgment but his self-righteous ranks would not do the men who had crucified Jesus they looked just like moral men too The soul that had put off salvation Not tonight, I'll get saved by and by But no time now to think of religion At last, they had found time and oh, what a weeping and a wailing As the lost were told of their fate They cried to the rocks and the mud
forward here, there are three major points that we want to make about sugar and its damage in the system. First of all, let's look at depression of the immune response. We know that white blood cells are able to destroy bacteria in the system. But as we ingest sugar, as we take sugar in, notice that when we go from zero to six, a white blood cell, instead of being able to manage 14 enemy bacteria, when we have taken in six teaspoons of sugar, that same white blood cell can only manage 10 enemy bacteria. And when we go to 12 teaspoons of sugar, we notice that that is cut in half. And now that same white blood cell is only able to manage 5.5. And when we go to 18, it reduces to two. And finally, at 24 teaspoons of sugar, what we would find, say, in an ice cream sundae, we have hand-to-hand -hand combat. So sugar has a very marked negative effect on the immune response. Now let's look at low blood sugar. When we ingest significant amounts of sugar, our graphic over here on the far side shows us what happens. Let's look at how the blood sugar reacts with a, an apple, sugar that's locked in fiber. You can see that blood sugar goes up and then it levels off nicely and we have a nice even release of sugar. Applesauce, the second line, a similar kind of thing, but you'll notice that it's lower than what we got from the whole apple. But look at what, happened, what happens when we ingest apple juice, which is a refined, a simple sugar. You notice that the blood sugar drops way down and takes a long time to even approach what we got from the apple. In fact, it never even comes near the even blood sugar release that we got from the apple. So we can see that simple sugars really have an effect on the system in terms of lowering your blood sugar and creating low blood sugar problems. Now as far as premature aging is concerned, we know that sugar also links up with proteins to create some trouble in the body. Uh, they're called uh, advanced glycation end products or glycosylated proteins. These proteins have again an effect on premature aging. First of all, they weaken the arterial vessels in the body. They create uh, free radical damage in the body. And one of the things that we can notice very, very markedly in the, in the body is that sugar creates wrinkles and stiffness. So it's important to remember then that when we ingest sugar, we really create some important problems for the system. We need to use sugar in the form that the creator provided sugar, that is locked in fiber with all of the antioxidants and good things that he provided. Go into all the world instantly. 3ABN beams its television and radio signals to the GE4 satellite to all of North America. This programming can be received by thousands of people using a 36-inch dish available from 3ABN, as well as over 110 TV stations and hundreds of cable companies all across the continent. This satellite signal can also be received in Hawaii, the Caribbean, and Central America using a larger dish also available from 3ABN. Our television programming is also carried on the Dominion Sky Angel system, which delivers multiple 24-hour Christian and family-friendly television and radio channels using the small 18-inch dish. Another transmitter beams the good news of the gospel to the Pass 9 satellite, which covers all of North, Central, and South America, as well as Europe with 3ABN's television and radio signals. In Europe, the signal is picked up by a teleport and retransmitted to the Hotbird system with its 93 million potential viewers. Then the signal is retransmitted to the TICOM 3 satellite, which stretches the reach of the gospel from Africa to Australia, from the Middle East to the Far East. In addition, a full power 3ABN station in Manila, Philippines reaches over 20 million potential viewers 24 hours a day. But that's not all. 3ABN television and radio networks are available over the internet 24 hours a day, anywhere in the world. And to make the picture and sound as clear as possible, 3ABN uses a private, high-speed network to bring the signal directly to your internet service provider. The result is amazing picture and sound quality for high-speed internet users. Making 3ABN radio and television much more appealing than most streaming feeds. Never has the reach of the gospel been so broad and far-reaching. Today, every inhabited continent of the earth is blanketed by 3ABN's life-changing programming. We praise the Lord for His anointing on the network. 
We thank you, our faithful viewers, for your prayers and financial support. Now, let's take a look at some of the highlights this year in the different areas of this ministry. We have so much to share, so let's start with engineering. This year, we began receiving FCC construction permits granted from the applications 3ABN submitted in the year 2000. To date, we've received permits to build 11 new television stations, and we've gotten the green light on another 39 television stations as well. Hundreds of thousands of new viewers will soon be able to watch 3ABN's Christ-centered programming through these new stations. In addition, there's been a tremendous challenge to convert our master control facilities to a new digital television format. The FCC has mandated this change for all television stations and networks. And here's Moses Primo, 3ABN's Director of Broadcasting and Engineering, with some important news on this subject. Here in the engineering department, we are so excited about the things that are happening in the year 2002, and we want to tell you a lot about those things, but we only have a few moments, and I want to tell you that we have changed many channels in the downlink stations, because FCC mandated that we vacate those channels to give to a digital television stations. But we want to praise the Lord, because we haven't lost one single channel. We, we were able to find new channels and replace them, and you are watching in these downlink stations. Another area that we are very excited about is the new master control. It's going to be all digital. It's going to be a state-of-art technology. Uh, we just uh, signed a, a large automation system uh, contract that will be able to bring four channels online and that uh, will be able to do many different languages. And we are very excited about that. Another area that we are excited also is about the new Spanish and Portuguese channel. This is going to be a 24-7 channel that will be preaching the gospel and preaching the three angels message in their own language. So people that are in South America or some, some countries in Europe, they'll be able to listen and to understand in their own language that Jesus died for them and that he's coming back soon. We just praise the Lord for his blessings. And we want to thank you for your prayers and your support. Thank you, Moses, for that incredible report. In addition, Moses reported that during a recent trip to Brazil, cable company officials representing 4 million viewers expressed their eagerness to carry the Spanish-Portuguese channel on their systems. It's important to note that there are more people worldwide who speak Spanish and Portuguese than all the English-speaking people combined. What a blessing this will be to them, and what an opportunity for evangelism. Let's take a look at our programming department next. This year, we've shown a record number of evangelistic programs from all over the world. The Lord is blessed abundantly as we continue our commitment to preach the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And we've been happy to join hands with the Seventh-day Adventist World Church in providing airtime free of charge for the purpose of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every day, we hear stories of people who've been blessed by these programs, and we're happy that we can provide worldwide coverage for these events. Our three studios have stayed busy this year, taping many hundreds of hours of new programming for our existing series. And in addition, we've been busy developing and taping even more new programs. This year, we began a new series with marriage and family educators, Harvey and Kathy Corwin.